Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be my wrap-up for this past week here in the middle of June of 2017. As you can see, we're still packing up to move. This is the last thing that I'm going to be packing up, so that'll be this afternoon. I may shoot one more video that I'll post next week, but it will clearly be something that I pre-recorded, because next weekend I will be in the process of moving. All right, so this week the first thing that I read was Jan Wong's Red China Blues, which is a memoir of the author's time. First, as one of only two Western students who were admitted to a university in Beijing in 1972, at a point where she was both very naive and very sort of pro-communist, because she was you know, that was the time they were, you know, the generation of 68 and they you know, didn't trust people over 30. So she was a dedicated Maoist in a way that people in China almost couldn't believe. And she ended up informing on people, which is horrible. And in the narration, she's aware in retrospect of how horrible that was, but she was genuinely this true believer in her youth. And then the second part of the book is when she returned to China as a journalist in the late 80s, which is fascinating because she and a lot of other journalists were staying at a hotel that overlooked Tiananmen Square during the time of the protests and of the massacre. So she witnessed all of that. And I think the images that remain of that are mostly of, you know, the one protester and the tank sort of dancing with each other. And it was really interesting to get this kind of context from someone who was literally sitting on her balcony watching things happen. So yeah, really interesting stuff. I was a huge fan of Jan Wong's Lunch with Jan Wong column in the Globe and Mail. And I know there are a lot of people who didn't like that in that column. She used to have lunch with celebrities and politicians and things like that that mostly make fun of them afterwards, but sometimes just share surprising stories about them. And I know some people really didn't like that, and her writing style is definitely the same as that. So I feel like if you're not a fan of her writing style, I don't think this is going to convert you to it, but if you are a fan of her writing style, which I am, I, th I thought this was fantastic. And the contrasts between both her very naive young self and her more cynical professional self in those, you know, 15 years are just really interesting because you're, you're watching both the culture shift in China and also the personal shift in her own life. It also explains something that I always wondered because I've always thought you know, she's from Montreal and uh, I, I always thought she had a little bit of a, an American writing style, and reading this I, I understood why, because her husband is American and she went to grad school in the US, and I kind of went, oh okay, that's where that comes from, because I had always kind of wondered. I almost feel wrong saying I enjoyed it, which I did, because it deals with some really depressing bits of what people do to each other, but uh, yeah, it's well done. And because that didn't depress me enough about what people do to each other, I followed that up by reading The Bosnia List which is written by Kenan Trebinchevich and uh, co-written by Susan Shapiro. So he was between the ages of 11 and 12 during the Bosnian War, and he was from a, a Bosnian Muslim family in a town that was quite mixed. There were Muslims and Serbs and Croats. We all know what happened in the Balkans after Yugoslavia ceased being Yugoslavia. And you can imagine that this is not going to be, it's not going to restore a lot of your faith in humanity. Uh, because, interestingly, a lot of the reasons that his family members survived are just sort of the random luck of his father was an athletic trainer who ran a gym. And his father and brother, for example, were in a concentration camp. And the only reason that nothing bad happened to them was because the head had known his father through this gym. And you think, oh, well, that's nice, he wasn't all bad, but this was somebody who did horrific things to other people. So it's very um, very almost random that he made this exception for this guy's family. It doesn't paint any picture of, you know, here's somebody who is a savior amongst these bad people. It's like, here was a bad person who made this exception for a couple of people. It, it's interesting like that. It, he talks also about it, these neighbors in their building, and the husband of the couple protected them and the wife would come into their house and steal their things. It's full of things like that. So his family were ended up as refugees in the United States when he was 13, and 20 years after that, he, his brother, and his father go back to Bosnia to see the relatives that are still there, and also to go back to their town and where they're gonna face some of those neighbors. 
and some of the drama is because he he has this real feeling that he he wants to look people in the eyes and say do you regret this and he has kind of aggressive feelings towards people for that whereas his father and his brother are very much you know leave it alone and don't cause trouble and so on and and so there's that interesting conflict that runs through the whole thing i thought it was interesting the voice in this because the the main author is not a writer or a journalist he's a physiotherapist and the voice in this is very much a kind of bro kind of voice which i thought was really interesting so yeah this was well worth the read so after that i turned to some fluff and read uh, the first volume of mike carey's suicide risk which is a superhero slash science fiction story about a police officer whose partner is severely injured by some supervillains and he basically goes and makes a drug deal that will give him superpowers. This is an introductory volume, so I enjoyed it because it had a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I liked the art. It, it does some things that I liked. It didn't go into deep explanations of backstories. It just let things flow. However, as the story goes on, I, I feel like this is the kind of book where I might rate it slightly higher or slightly lower, depending on where some of these things go. Because I admired what I assume is, is basically an introductory chapter, and depending on how things are followed up on, that will either be more or less impressive, depending on how that, how that goes. But yeah, as an introduction, I quite liked this. It wasn't spectacular, but it was an interesting enough alternative take that I had fun reading it. And I followed that up with a bit more fluff. With This is Volume 3 of The Chronicles of Legion, Blood Brothers. This is a series that is sort of an alternate take on the Dracula story. It's about two brothers, Vlad and Radu, who are not sort of non-traditional vampires. They basically possess people through the centuries. And in this we see uh, there's a, a woman in South America, there's a man in Russia, there's a man in England at various points in history. The art is very nicely done. None of the storylines get a huge amount of depth. This is not a book that is super interested in storytelling. It is mostly about the ideas and then the visual presentation. And I thought the ideas were interesting. Uh, I liked seeing the various countries and points in history. As I said, I liked the art in this. But yeah, if you're looking for a more in-depth story, that's not what this is. But what it was uh, really trying to do, I think it did well. And then finally, I read Pyongyang, A Journey in North Korea, which is Guy Delis memoir of his time working at an animation studio in North Korea. He is originally from Quebec, but he was working for a French animation company that outsourced a lot of their background work to this animation studio in North Korea. And he went and worked with them for a few months. And it's a, a kind of snarky view of those couple of months. Basically his hotel was on an island, and this is the island of foreigners, it has things they can do, but only some things. There are a lot of travel restrictions. He has to have an interpreter and a guide. And a lot of it portrays it as almost as if the country, as a foreigner in North Korea, it's almost as if he's being shown a theater production of something. The reality is always slightly further out. And he talks about how sometimes someone, he'll talk to another foreigner who got lost somewhere and saw a slum, and that's very horrified. He, at one point, he was accused of having taken a picture of garbage <laughs> and so the, uh, his film was taken away yeah so it's full of interesting little stories like that uh, one of my cousins has been to north korea and his stories about not being able to go out of the hotel without your interpreter and guide and all of that were very much like this so that was kind of neat to see that it was very similar to that there have been several memoirs of people who have escaped north korea to either south korea or china that have been fairly popular i've seen quite a few reviews of those on booktube. And I think this would make a kind of neat companion piece to that, just because it's such a different perspective. This was definitely well worth having read. The art style is very simple, and I think that lends a lot to both the humor and the, and the kind of sense of boredom that I think was going on in a lot of it as well. Yeah, so good stuff. All right, so that was my week. Next weekend, I'm going to be moving. I'm going to try to pre-record a couple of things, so I'll have something to post early next week. But uh, we'll see how that goes. And I hope you all have a good week. That's it for now. Ciao.